May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be always acceptable unto thee, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. So Jesus goes into the synagogue at Capernaum and teaches. And the people were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. The scribes had plenty of learning. They had plenty of knowledge. But they did not speak on their own authority. They simply taught what they had studied in the law of Moses and other scholars. But here is Jesus going beyond all of that. We don't know what he said on this occasion, but evidently he did not speak like a scholar so much as he spoke like a prophet. Direct and to the point, authoritative. Of course, there should be no surprise in this for us, right? Those of us who already follow Jesus know that Jesus is not merely a prophet, even, but the king over all kings, and not only the king, but God himself. He is the author of the law that the scribes interpret. And so it is entirely reasonable that he should speak with authority. Even the demons know this, and that's why they try one last-ditch effort to sidetrack him. Notice that the unclean spirit actually speaks the truth, but in such a way as to confuse the issue. What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. We're not told whether the man was already known to be demonized or not. But who is the us? Does it mean, what have you to do with us, the people of Capernaum? Or what have you to do with us, the followers of Satan? Or both? And again, who who is he asking about when he says, have you come to destroy us? These are always the confusion, these are always the weapons of the enemy. Confusion, for one, um, and alienation and terror. But technically, no lie has actually been told. The knowledge that the demon has is real knowledge. It is just being used in the service of deception. And so Jesus rebukes the unclean spirit. Be silent and come out of him, he says. He doesn't argue with the demon. He doesn't dither. He simply commands silence and departure. Even though the spirit has witnessed truly to his identity, he does not allow it to speak again. I believe Jesus silences the demon because it has knowledge, but refuses to love. St. Paul tells us that knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Knowledge gives worldly freedom and power, and so it causes, often, conceit and arrogance. It puffs you up so that you're full of hot air, but empty. Love, on the other hand, builds you up into something solid. I I have a fondness for um, an old British slang term. Do you know the the term brick? No? (laughs) My wife is nodding her head. Um, a, A brick, if you call somebody a brick, then He's solid and dependable and righteous. He's a a great guy, right? Love turns you into that kind of person, a brick, something solid. But the kind of love we are talking about is not an emotion. The kind of love we're talking about is not something you experience. It is something that you do. 
The fact is that love builds up the one who loves because he is in the act of building someone else up, the person he's loving. It's a paradox. You build someone else up, you actually end up building yourself up. Or you can do the opposite of both. Part of the reason that knowledge puffs up is that the pursuit of knowledge is a process of consumption. You consume it. When you learn something, you are taking something into yourself in order to use it. But love has an entirely outward-facing stance. Love gives itself away, and so it becomes more solid. The debate in Corinth that St. Paul was addressing evidently centered around meat, of all things. Much of the meat available in the market had come from the pagan temples where it had been sacrificed to pagan idols and then butchered to be sold. Now, some Corinthian Christians argued, follow their argument here, they argued that since those idols had no reality, since they were just lumps of stone and metal, the consecration of animal sacrifices to them seemed a mere farce to Christian believers. So there was nothing actually wrong with the meat, and so Christians could eat it with a clear conscience. Other people, the opposing party, argued that while the lumps of stone and metal had no spiritual significance in and of themselves, there were certainly real evil spirits whom those idols represented. And so anything consecrated to them was then defiled, and Christians must not partake of it. It's a naughty problem, right? It's not an easy one. You can see both sides. So, St. Paul addresses this problem this way. He agrees with the first set. He says that for us, there is one God, the Father, from whom all are all things and for whom we exist. And one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. Therefore, for those who have this knowledge, who understand this, it is not wrong to eat the meat sacrificed in the pagan temples. So he says to the first group, yes, you're right, you have reasoned correctly. But then he continues. He says, if we act on that knowledge, knowing also that we have brothers and sisters who do not have that knowledge or may, or, or may disagree with it, and that they may be led into activity against their consciences, then we are not behaving in a loving manner. You see, if, if, the, if the person who doesn't believe that he may eat that meat, then sees you eating the meat and goes, oh, what the, you know, and does it anyway, he has now done something against his conscience. He believes that he knows he shouldn't do it, and he's done it anyway. He has sinned. Even though it's not wrong, St. Paul says, to eat the meat, that man has sinned because he believed it was wrong and did it anyway. And to induce someone to do that is also sin. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up both the brother and the self. The more loving thing to do would be to go hungry so that your brother won't sin. As a community, 
Our life together must be built on love, not just on knowledge. It must be built with love, or it will not be built at all. It must be built not on knowing our rights, but on giving them away. Not on controlling each other, but on controlling ourselves. Not on insisting that things be the way we want them, but on laying down our desires for each other and helping to bear each other's burdens. Not on consuming and using each other, but on loving and serving each other. We follow a Lord who spoke with authority, but he also gave himself completely. A Lord who would say, be silent, come out of him, and then lay down his life for his friends and for his enemies. A real man who had the greatest freedom and power and right of anyone in the world before or since, but who emptied himself taking the form of a slave so that we might be empowered to speak with authority and then to lay our lives down too. So, if you are annoyed by someone else in this community, Consider how you may serve that person. If you feel hurt by someone, pray for him. If your needs are not being met, meet someone else's. If we can submit and do this, God will use us. He won't merely use us, he will love us, but he already did that. But if we can do all of this, then God can use us like a mighty sword to cast out evil and to spread the good news of his love for all people through us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.